So welcome to our session on financial ratios. So in this segment, we're going to learn how to interpret financial statements for a wide range of organizations. We're going to learn financial analysis in understanding how it helps business owners and other in interested parties to analyzing financial statements. In our initial classes, we learned the key users of financial accounting information. Can somebody remind us who are the key users of financial accounting information? We have one, the shareholders. So there's what we call the shareholders ratios. Two, we have the managers. So in this case, we're going to have what are called efficiency ratios, which looks at how the managers themselves are using the assets of the business efficiently. We also have ratios called the liquidity ratios. And one of the key stakeholders in the users of financial accounting information are the creditors. So we will need to know how we're able to meet our short term and long term debt obligations. So it is important to understand financial accounting statements in that regard, because it's able to provide the interested pe people with key information for decision making, mainly, and ultimately, for business survival. Businesses exist for the following reasons. Number one, they exist for profitability. So these ratios will help an organization assess how profitable we are. Businesses also exist for survival. So this is able to give a picture, the health, it's an x-ray, which shows how the organs of a business are operating. And also the last reason why firms uh, exist is for the market share. And they capturing the market share. So we'll look at uh, profitability ratios. Are they making a profit? So the purpose of financial statement analysis is to evaluate a firm's performance, its financial performance and its financial position. It is also a means of comparison over time within the firm, between the firms and against particular industry averages. So intra-company basis is within intercompany is with the companies and against the industry benchmark averages. So financial analysis is very useful for decision making. Now, why are financial statement analysis and what does it involve? So it involves uh, providing information about the organization's present, future and past performance. It also gives a picture of the firm's earnings, the EPS, earning per share. So the shareholders are very keen and important uh, users of financial accounting information. They want to know how are we performing? How is my investment in this business in terms of uh, the dividends? It also gives a picture of the firm's solvency. And by solvency, we mean the ability to meet the short term debt obligations. So there are two key aspects under business survival, profitability and solvency. Profitability looks at the extent to which our revenues exceed expenses. And solvency looks at the ability that the firm has in meeting its financial obligations. So looking at this structure, it gives us a picture of the effective financial statement analysis use. Number one, is for internal factors. Internal factors to give us an overall picture through what are called strategies within a firm, the objectives of the firm. So it helps us do checks and balances within a firm to see are we performing well? For external use, we use it to give us a general picture of how the firm is in terms of the industry factors. There are benchmarks that an industry must have below which a firm must not go. There are other macro factors like GDP, inflation rate, 
exchange rates that a PEM must also look into. So these ones give a broader picture of how the PEM will perform overall. So in a nutshell, to perform an effective financial statement analysis, you need to be aware of a PEM strategy, what is our and debt? Is it to break even? Is it to make a profit? Are we meeting our profit? You need to understand the objectives. Why are we in existence? We also need to, uh, we need to have an annual report and other documents such as articles about the organization in the newspapers. That's what the press would be interested in understanding for public reviews, business reviews, knowing how, what is happening in the market. So effective financial statement analysis requires you to understand the nature of the business in the industry. There are certain industries that you should not pursue because of the time period in which you would want to invest them in. Now, under financial statement analysis, we have what we call ratio analysis and we have a comparative financial statement analysis which has a horizontal stroke trend analysis and a vertical uh, component percentage analysis. So we're going to start with financial uh, ratio analysis where we're going to look at five key ratios that are used to measure the liquidity of a firm using the liquidity ratios, the profitability of a firm using profitability ratios, the reliance on finance debt, or debt finance using what are called gearing ratios. I must submit to you that firms operate on a credit basis mainly. And so the extent to which a firm is financed by debt will give the level of associated risks attached to it. More debt, more risk. So the gearing and leverage ratios will deal with that. Then to look at what is called the effectiveness of managing a firm's resources. So we have efficiency ratios or asset management ratios. Being a manager, you will need to account for how the assets that you're trying for were utilized. So it is important in that regard. So let us now go to financial ratio analysis. Financial ratio analysis involves calculating um, ratios from one source of data to another. So what is a ratio from our grade three? Just comparing or expressing relationships between two figures. So that's a simple definition of a ratio. 2 over 3 is a ratio in itself. So these are key and they're used to help interpreting how the firm has performed. So financial ratios can be classified into five categories, like I mentioned the liquidity ratios or solvency ratios. They will give or show a firm's ability to meet the short term obligation. We have the profitability ratios, which gauge a firm's profitability based on the sales based on the turnover, which is the sales, and based on the assets that are in the firm, the capital expenditure. Efficiency ratios will give a picture of how the assets have been used to generate sales. And leverage ratios will show you the extent to which we are financed by debt. And finally, the shareholders ratios or investment ratios will show you the performance of the investment in terms of shares. So these are the overall ratios that you need to know about. These are the important ratios that we need to know about. So we'll now go down to calculating these ratios. So under liquidity ratio, we have two key ratios. We have what is called the current ratio and the quick acid test ratio. Current ratio and the quick acid test ratio. What does the current ratio measure. It's given by the formula current assets divided by current liabilities. Current assets divided by current liabilities. 
So it measures our short term obligations. But from this formula, if we remove from the current assets, we remove the inventory. And we divide by the current liabilities. We call this a quick asset test ratio. It is mainly used for immediate debt obligations on the assumption that if somebody wants their money, you may not necessarily find um, quick money by pointing at the inventory that you have the stock. So you remove the stock, at least this will be our money that we can have in hand quickly. So the benchmark for a current ratio is that for every two assets we should have, we should have one Congolese, so two to one. For this one, the benchmark is that for every one asset we should have, at least there should be one uh, liability. So this is on the liquidity ratios. So we also have what are called efficiency ratios, where we have the inventory turnover, which looks at how many times we're able to restock, to sell or clear our stock available. It's given by the cost of goods sold divided by the average inventory. We also have the receivables turnover, which looks at the credit sales divided by the average accounts receivable. Credit sales divided by the average accounts receivable. If you multiply this, then the number of days gives you what we call the creditors or debtors turnover looks at how long it takes for our data to pay us. So we'll look at these formulas in depth, but just generally giving you an overview. We have what we call a total asset turnover, which is simply the total revenue divided by the sales. Total revenue divided by the average total assets. So total revenue divided by the average total assets. Then we also have the debt ratio, which looks at the liabilities divided by the total assets, how much liabilities are there compared to the assets that we have. We also have the long-term debt to equity ratio, looks at the long-term divided by the owner's equity, how much of the firm's uh, debt is there in proportion to the equity. Then finally, we have the profitability ratio, so we have the GPM, the gross profit margin, which simply is the gross profit divided by the sales times 100. The net profit margin is net profit divided by sales times 100. And finally, the return on equity, which is simply the net profit divided by the owner's equity times 100. Now, let me delve in explaining what our liquidity uh, ratios are about. So remember, there's a term called working capital, which is very important and it's a topic on its own. It gives a signal on the firm's ability to meet the short-term obligations. Our total current assets are called the gross working capital. When we subtract the liabilities, we call that the net working capital. So to meet the short-term obligations, we have two ratios, which are the current ratio and the quick asset ratio. So they're important because they help gauge the firm's ability to, to meet the short term debt obligations. So this is a formula for the current ratio, current assets over current liabilities. These ones are for immediate liabilities to pay the current debts that are over this. The benchmark, like I said, is two to one. Where we have the quick acid test, we remove the stock. These ones are more rigorous than the current ratio because it only considered cash receivables. The benchmark is one to one. So we also have the profitability ratios. In the long run, liquidity and solvents become meaningless if the firm is not profitable. You need to remain profitable because profitability is important for survival and prosperity. You may have uh, no assets to liquidate, but at least you should make a profit. So profitability really refers to the ability 
that a firm has in earning excess income over expenses. So a profitable company must always ensure that all the expenses that you have are covered with an extra income, at least. So profitability ratios focus on gross profit, which gives us GPM, gross profit over sales times 100. It also focuses on the net profit, which helps us control expenses. The gross profit helps us control our trading margin, the sales, analyzing them. And finally, we have what is called the return on assets. So under return on assets, we look at these three that are used interchangeably. The return on capital employed, return on assets, or return on equity. So gross profit is gross profit times 100 over the sales. Okay, so now I'm going to look at the GPM. I've already given you the formula. Gross profit over um, the cost of sales times 100 sales so these ones they compute other ratios before interest and tax so sometimes people have a problem in understanding whether we're including tax or not so the gross profit has two main factors that it determines Com competition and the product mix competition and the product mix the net profit margin has already been explained. It excludes what? Tax. So it measures the overall efficiency of the firm's operating uh, operation activities. It's important to include profitability ratios because this ratio indicates how productive the firm is retain on assets this what i'm talking about is very important because when you're doing the ratio analysis you need to explain the implications of your ratios so the return on asset shows you how much money the company has earned on each quarter invested in the assets every extra asset how much money we have made towards profit how much money has been contributed towards the profit so it measures the overall that the company is earning in terms of profitability so the higher the ratio the greater the return on the assets so we also have the return on equity which is a net profit over average equity this ratio indicates the amount of net earnings that result from an investment uh, equity the shareholders are very interested in this ratio because it will show them how much they're earning on their, on their equity, on their investment. So how much profit goes to their equity. It also gives a picture of the overall efficiency of the firm in managing what? Their total investments that are in the assets and generating what? A return towards. So it looks at the picture from the other angle, the equity, how much does it contribute to the profit? So using return on equity, you're able to gauge whether the company is a value creator or it's being, uh, or cash is being created from the existing assets. So it's important that you do not only pump in money in a firm, let the firm also contribute money to the assets that you introduce through your equity. So this is what we call the return on equity analysis structure. You put in your equity. So your equity in level one, you're going to have returns from operating activities. Then there are returns that come from non-operating activities. So the returns from the operating uh, uh, activities will be split into profitability and asset utilization. The returns that will come into non-operating um, activities are split into financial leverage and uh, the spread. So asset management or efficiency measures. This is another ratio, which is called an asset management ratio, which gives a picture of how productive the company is regarding its assets. 
it seeks to answer the question, is our capital being utilized well to attain a certain level of sales volume? So it shows us how that a one part of the assets is generating how much of the sales. So for every one part of the assets, how much contribution goes to the sales? So as assets turnover increases, there's a greater cash inflow from the sales. So if you are dealing with a transport industry, for instance, the assets that you bring to the business through buses can be measured in how much revenue you may be getting. So more assets, more sales. So the asset has the following ratios. We have what we call the asset turnover, which is given by the sales divided by the total assets. So this ratio represents the efficiency of asset usage to generating sales revenue. So it measures the management's ability to generate revenues from investments in assets. Generally, this means that if you have a smaller investment in assets, there will be a small proportion that will be attached to the sales. So as you are doing your analysis, please make them more interesting. Give an elaborate illustration of how each of the ratios can be interpreted. So this ratio also indicates the firm that the firm that has less money tied to assets will have less sales that will emanate attached to, to the sales. So we, under asset management, we have what we call the data turnover, which measures the times trade receivables turnover during the year. It shows you how the firm may take time to collect the credit sales and the time the sale was made. The higher the data turnover, the shorter the period. So our data turnover simply talks about how long it takes for them to pay us in days. So if you have a high data turnover, it means they're paying in good time. So a lower ratio is indication that there are problems within the firm. It's ironic one. Similarly, if we're dealing with the credit turnover, it looks at the time it takes for us as a company to pay our credit purchases. So a higher credit turnover means we are paying back in very short period of time. So credit as turnover is best compared to the industry level. The industry will give you that 40 days is the recommended credit as turnover and we have uh, 25. So it means we have a high credit as turnover we're paying in good time. We also have what is called stock turnover, which looks at how long it takes for us to convert our inventory into sales. So inventory does not need to stay for so long. There are costs attached to keeping inventory for a long time. Cost of storage, cost of handling, cost of security. So cost of expiring of products. So a high stock turnover means it takes time for us to sell our stock is given by the cost of goods sold over our inventory, our stocks. So it is best to have a very fast inventory turnover. However, it's also important that we keep a certain level of inventory to avoid stock out. The stock out is a cost for not having stock that customers may find to buy. So we also have what is called the net working capital turnover. We know that net working capital or net working capital is simply current assets minus current abilities. So sales divided by the net current uh, working turn, uh, capital turnover. So it really looks at how the working capital employed contributes to the sales. So our working capital turnover measures the net revenue that is generated in monetary value from the working capital. So it's best to compare this to the industry level as well. So we also finally have the gearing ratios, which are the percentage 
of capital employed to that financed by debt. So if we have a high gearing ratio, it means our dependence is highly dependent on borrowing and it's not very advisable for a firm to be solely dependent on borrowing. It poses a financial risk that may increase volatility to the profits. When profits are volatile, they are fragile, they're easily able to, to, to change. They'll easily be converted into a means of just paying off your debts. So if you have a lower gearing ratio, it means there is a higher dependence on what? Equity. If you have a high gearing ratio, you have high dependence on what? Debt. So the gearing ratio is as follows. Debt to total assets. So this measures how much of uh, assets we have compared to our debt. Our debt to equity ratio looks at how much of our debt we have compared to our equity. And we also have the interest end, times interest end, which is the earnings before interest and tax over the interest. This measures the extent to which our operating income can decline before the firm is unable to meet its annual interest costs. It looks at the extent to which the income can decline before the firm is unable to meet its annual interest costs. So we always have industry levels that we are able to match our performances to. Finally, we have what we call market test ratios. These are usually based on the perceptions that the market has on the company. We have the PE, the price earning ratio, which is a very important uh, ratio to the shareholders. We have the dividend yield, which is given by gross dividend per share over the market price per share. Now these formulas are dependent on each other. You get one correct, the others will be correct. You get one wrong, the others will be wrong because each of these ones are dependent on the other. So earning per share is the net profit after tax over the number of order shares issued. The dividend per share, we're going to have the dividends over the number of dividend, ordinary shares uh, issued. Now, the dividend payout ratio is dividends over the earnings per share. Okay. So now we can go into an illustration of a question. So for you to understand this, at least you should know how financial statements look like. So we have the sales, the income, uh, the statement of the financial performance. So we have the income statement here, and we have the financial statement here, which is a balance sheet. Okay. So with these two statements, we now need to make an analysis. So Before I proceed, so join us in the next session for the interpretation of these ratios. So take note of these two statements, which I'll look at the interpretation in the next session. Thank you so much.